So, unless we stand on the brink of some unforeseen medical miracle, I can virtually guarantee that all of you have been infected with, are currently infected with, and will be infected with some sort of viral parasite. They are everywhere. They are pervasive. They are on my little red dot with me. They're in your chairs with you. They're in the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe. They're on our skin, they're in our bodies, they're even in our genome. Viruses, dead, defective, ancient viruses, compose up to 8% of our genome. That's approximately 240 million base pairs of our genome are ancient viruses. Dead, ancient foes in an ancient battle in an ongoing war between the host and a pathogen. Some of these viruses that are around today, of which hundreds infect us as a prey, come and go without us even knowing that they were there. Others are around for a lifetime. Some bring us to our knees, and some even hold our entire civilization captive. Some of our more famous uh, enemies include HPV, the common cold, hepatitis, yellow fever, Ebola, polio, rubella, smallpox, hantavirus, measles, H1N1 influenza, rabies, herpes, HIV, SARS, and the list goes on and on and on. And so the question I want to talk to you about today is what's the difference between those viruses that bring us to our knees and those that we don't even know we have? What's the difference between those viruses our bodies can clear and those that our bodies cannot? The differences between those viruses that we can control and those that control us? What's the difference between the viruses that are up here and those viruses that are lying dead and defective in our genome? So before we get into that, you really need to understand a couple things about viruses. Viruses are tiny intracellular parasites, only hundredths the size of one of our own cells, and they are absolutely dependent on the human cell for all of its replicative capacity. What I mean by that is independent of a human cell, a virus cannot replicate its DNA. It needs our cells for basic metabolic processing, from transcription and translation to protein folding, protein modification, intracellular trafficking, signal transduction, lipid metabolism, you name it, and the viruses virtually are entirely dependent on our cells for those processes. So what that means is that our um, cells as a host and the virus is involved in this very intricate balance between us and them. Case in point, consider HIV. HIV is a very small virus, a retrovirus. Its genome is about one ten thousandth the size of a percent the size of our genome. It encodes only 18 proteins, as opposed to our genome, which encodes over 23,000. And yet those 18 simple proteins are enough to hijack every system within our cell in order that our cells are focused on the sole purpose of replicating more HIV virions as fast as possible and with the highest amount of fidelity we can muster. This is a graphic of the HIV human interactome. All of the gray ovals around the periphery are one of the 18 HIV proteins, and each of the colored dots next to it are a human protein with which these HIV proteins interact. Each line represents a functional interaction. These simple 18 proteins network like this in every single infected cell to take that cell over and reprogram it for the sole purpose of reproducing more HIV virions. The point of all of this is just so you understand the degree to which the host and its pathogen are in an intricate balance that has been perfected over countless generations of coevolution. That is not to say that we are completely defenseless. We have four primary levels of defense against a viral pathogen. The first of which is simply our physical barriers, 
our skin, our mucous membranes, that based on temperature, sheer physical barrier, pH, proteolytic secretions, what have you, prevent any pathogens from entering our body at all. Second, right behind that, if a pathogen does manage to gain access, we have an innate immune system. The function of that system is to trigger a generic response against any incoming pathogen, sort of whatever it may be. So if it finds something coming in, it triggers to stop it. It's very generic, it is not specialized, and it's pretty much the same across the board. This includes activating cells to search out and destroy those invading pathogens, cells that secrete small molecules that induce um, various responses in our own bodies, such as inflammation, and other things that we commonly consider with an illness, such as fever, coughing, sneezing, uh, fatigue, all induced in response to an invading pathogen. The innate immune system also coordinates carefully with a third layer of defense, our adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system, the best way to explain this. So consider the innate immune system similar to our border patrol or our coast guard, um, basic infantry, that if an invader crosses our borders, it stops them there. Our adaptive immune system then is our Navy SEALs, our Marines highly trained and specialized to target out a specific threat and eliminate or neutralize it. It changes over time with the pathogen to figure out the best way to eliminate it and all infected cells from our body. It's an incredibly elegant system our body has designed to combat a changing uh, pathogen within our bodies. Now these three layers of defense are typically good enough to stop most infections. However, some pathogens are able to get beyond that, in which point we must rely on human ingenuity and the scientific community to provide some therapeutic intervention. Even in the presence of all four of these layers, there still are some viruses and pathogens that can get around that. And case in point would be HIV. HIV infects over 33 million currently and accounts for nearly 2 million deaths every year. We do have treatments. However, these treatments are expensive, they're invasive, they're susceptible to resistance, and they do not provide a cure. They allow people to live, but those people are living with HIV. Living with HIV means you are responsible for every drop of your blood, every cut on your arm, every scrape on your knee, is your responsibility to the entire civilization, everyone who's around you. Living with HIV means you are the scapegoat for all of the ignorant who refuse to educate themselves on what HIV is and how it works, dealing with those people who will discriminate against you sheerly for your blood status, people who are afraid to sit next to you, share a meal, shake your hand. Living with HIV is no way to live at all, and it needs a cure. However, if we are ever going to cure HIV, if we are ever going to help these people who have to stare down the word infected every day of their life, we need to understand what HIV's strengths are and how to target those strengths. Part of the strength has to do with this. HIV can get around all of our defenses, our body puts up, and our therapeutics, partially because of this. It has co-evolved with us through other species to not only just replicate with fidelity and efficiency, but to turn off our defenses. Some of these interactions represent turning off of our innate immune system. Some of these interactions combat our adaptive immune system. However, that's not the end of the story. Even if we induce therapeutics, HIV still finds a way around them, still finds a way to persist. And so the question is, why? And the answer is actually fairly simple. It's mutation. HIV and all viruses possess a highly optimized mutation rate that allows the virus to balance replicative fidelity with efficiency and while maintaining genetic diversity in the viral population. So what does that exactly mean? It's easy to understand what happens if you have too much mutation. 
If the virus simply jacks its mutation up, rate up too high, it can't synthesize the 18 proteins that it requires to replicate. Simple enough. However, what happens if HIV has too low of a mutation rate? Remember I told you about our adaptive immune system, which perfects itself to specifically eliminate an incoming pathogen. It adapts over time to better and better find a very specific threat. HIV gets around this by being highly diverse. It presents a moving target to the adaptive immune system such that it can never focus on an individual virion and take it out. So if we prevent the genetic diversity from ever occurring, HIV suddenly becomes a target for our own adaptive immune system to clear out naturally. And so HIV only exists because it can very carefully balance its need to have a lot of viruses that are faithfully reproduced and its need for genetic diversity. It has an optimal mutation rate. So how much mutation am I actually talking about? Well, consider it this way. An untreated, infected individual can produce somewhere in the range of 10 billion viruses every day. The mutation rate of HIV is such that one of every three of those viruses will carry a mutation. While a somewhat of an oversimplification, that still allows for approximately three billion distinct, unique viruses being produced in every infected person every single day. And the thing is, it only takes one. One virus with the correct set of mutations to get around a new innate defense, to get around a new adaptive response, or get around a new therapeutic. That is why HIV is so powerful. That is why HIV has a counter defense for every defense we come up with. That is why we do not have a cure. If you take nothing else from my talk today, this is what I really want you to remember. The ongoing conflict between a virus and its host is driven by mutation. And so controlling mutation is the key to determining the outcome of the infection. The ongoing conflict between a virus and its host is driven by mutation. And so if we want to cure that infection, we need to control that mutation. Or that's the theory. So how do we apply this practically? And I want to use HIV as an example because we are working off of this principle to develop novel therapeutics that work just like this. Luckily, the body has already done quite a bit of the work for us. It's very clever in its own right. And it already knew that its genetic code can be manipulated. And so what the body did was designed a series of innate immune proteins called the Apobex. What these proteins do is in an infected cell, they can incorporate into a budding virus. In a target cell, when that virus is starting to begin to try to replicate, these Apobex proteins mutate its DNA to such an extent that the DNA is either degraded or rendered non-functional. In other words, it increases the mutation rate of HIV to such an extreme the virus can no longer survive. Which is great. But of course, unsurprisingly, the virus has found a way around this. So HIV encodes a small protein called VIF. It's VIF's function to search and destroy Apobex. And it does it using our body's own degradation machinery. Because HIV is highly efficient, highly devious, and so that allows HIV to replicate without any apobec, no mutation, and you get a progeny virus. Unfortunately, it's not even as simple as that. Because HIV is also devilishly clever. It decided, as long as these mutating enzymes are around, why don't we just use them to increase our own genetic diversity? We just need to temper the amount of mutation. And so how VIF actually functions is sort of as a rheostat to fine tune the HIV mutation rate. So VIF degrades only some of the apobec in a cell, allowing some of it to still get packaged and provide a low level of mutation, providing progeny with a diverse set of viral sequences. So it uses apobec, our own defense against us, to increase its genetic diversity. To look at this another way, 
If you sequence viral genomes out of a cell without any APABEC, these are the mutations that you get. A few here and there. HIV has evolved other ways to put diversity into its genome at a low rate. And this is what you see here. In the presence of APABEC, each tick mark represents a new mutation. The sequences are utterly destroyed, mutated every other base pair in some cases, to where it can't reproduce whatsoever. And so by putting VIF in here, the virus effectively titrates down the amount of mutations to a, a level that doesn't kill the virus, but provides more um, variability within the population. And so this is the situation as we currently understand it. VIF degrades most of the APABEC, but allows some to get through to provide the optimal mutation rate that provides for replicative fidelity while providing diversity in the population. We can use this balance that HIV has created for itself. We can use it to develop novel therapeutics. And there are a couple different ways this can go. For example, we could develop novel therapeutics that inhibit VIF. If we inhibit VIF, it frees the APABEC, and the APABEC can get packaged and increase the mutation rate, leading to lethal levels of mutation. This is called lethal mutagenesis. On the other hand, we could go the other way. If we inhibit the APABEC, now the virus isn't packaging any of these DNA mutating enzymes. The genetic diversity falls off, and our body's adaptive immune system can clear the virus naturally. Two different routes using the same principle of altering the mutation rate to conquer a devastating virus like HIV. So at the end of the day, it all comes back to mutation. Viruses have evolved over millions of years of coevolution to optimize a mutation rate that allows it to reproduce quickly and efficiently while still giving itself some genetic diversity. Today we looked at one instance of how a virus carefully balances out the amount of mutation that it has. And by playing with this pathway between VIF and APABEC, we could hope to someday provide a cure to such a devastating disease as HIV. The ongoing conflict between a virus and its host is driven by mutation. And so controlling mutation is the key in determining the outcome of the infection. If we can do it with HIV, we can do it with other viruses too. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people who contributed to this work, my lab and so forth. Thank all the other HIV researchers out there who are fighting the good fight. Um, and thank all of you for paying such rapt attention. <laughs>